Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to a special Wednesday afternoon lecture, the annual Astute Clinician Lecture. And uh, one of our own, Dr. Marston Linehan, uh, will be shortly coming up to the podium uh, to tell you about his remarkable research observations in the area of kidney cancer. It's my pleasure to have a chance to introduce him, uh, somebody I've known uh, for probably 15 or 20 years, uh, who is absolutely uh, a leader in this field uh, that has contributed amazing insights into this common form of cancer, and someone who both runs an amazing laboratory, which is often the place we bring special dignitaries to, like the President of the United States, for instance, uh, but who also is an active surgeon uh, doing it all, and doing it with the most remarkable personal involvement that you would ever want to see in a doctor who's also taking care of patients and treating each one of them as what they would want to be, a special human individual with a special need uh, for medical and surgical care. Marston uh, got his undergraduate degree at Brown University, uh, went on to get the MD at the University of Oklahoma, and you might notice in his presentation there's some remnant of that uh, part of the country that's still uh, audible. Uh, he did a, a year of medicine at Oklahoma and then went on to Duke uh, in surgery and ultimately becoming chief resident in urologic surgery. And after that, uh, came here to the Mecca uh, as a senior investigator in the surgery branch where he is now the chief of the urologic oncology branch in the Center for Cancer Research. Uh, Marston also has appointments at USIS and at GW. Uh, but most of his work is done right here in this remarkable uh, clinical center. He's been recognized uh, by various awards, including the Dr. Nathan Davis Award of the American Medical Association, and he's an elected member of the Institute of Medicine. His longstanding interest in kidney cancer, and particularly the genetic basis of this disease, has resulted in remarkable revelations, including the von hippel lindau a gene, uh, the gene for hereditary papillary uh, renal carcinoma, uh, the FLCN gene, he's gonna tell you more about these things, I'm pretty sure. Uh, a total of five new diseases that have come out of this research effort. And as I'm sure he's going to reflect on, because the title here uh, points to it, what we're learning through this is not only uh, what is going on in terms of the inciting events in kidney cancer, but how that connects in a way that none of us would have suspected a few years ago uh, with metabolic pathways, that kidney cancer and metabolic uh, basis of disease are in fact tightly interlinked as they are in his title. So we could not have a better person for our astute clinician lecture uh, this particular year. It's my great pleasure to ask you to help me welcome Dr. Marston Linehan. Thank you, Dr. Collins, for the very, very kind introduction. I really appreciate it. And also, I'd like to actually extend my thanks to the uh, wonderful men and women I've had the opportunity to work with here for the last 32 years, and also particularly to Dr. John Gallen and the Clinical Center and his staff for making this a place where someone like me, uh, someone like us, our group, could uh, pursue these ideas, study these patients uh, over these years in this marvelous environment. So what we're going to talk about is kidney cancer, and kidney cancer affects worldwide about 300,000 patients and is responsible for about 100,000 deaths per year worldwide. In the U.S., it's about 65,000 affected and about 13,000 die. Now, as Dr. Collins mentioned, I'm a urologic surgeon, so in our area, uh, we work on prostate cancer, bladder cancer, kidney cancer. Now, kidney cancer happens to be the most lethal disease among those three. GU cancer is about t almost 25% of human cancer, but kidney is the one that causes the most lost years of life, so it really is the most lethal uh, cancer. We estimate there are about 200,000 alive in this country today with kidney cancer. Now, in the uh, spirit of this wonderful award, which I'm so touched to be uh, asked to give this lecture, uh, I'm going to sort of walk you through really our journey 
over the last 30 years in studying kidney cancer. And when I came here as a young guy, a young person, in the early 80s, I looked at kidney cancer and I said, well, kidney cancer, if someone comes with localized kidney cancer to someone like me, a urologic surgeon, we can take that out and we don't use the C word, the cure word, but we can give them a 95%, five or 10 year survival. However, then as pretty much as now, if they came to us with advanced disease, 82% of them died within 24 months. So we said, is there a way we can do something to change this? So we set out uh, early in the 80s with my wonderful colleague, Bert Zabar, uh, to study kidney cancer. And our hope was to identify, we thought, was the gene for kidney cancer. We had no idea it would be genes. And one of the things, if you remember one thing during this talk, probably is this slide and the next one. And that is that kidney cancer is not kidney cancer. In those days, we treated all patients with kidney cancer the same, did the same operations, gave them the same drugs if they had metastatic disease, none of which worked. Now we know that kidney cancer is not a single disease. It's a number of different types of cancer that just happen to occur in this organ. They have different histologies, different clinical course, respond differently to therapy, and as I'll show you, are caused by different genes. Now, we started out, Bert Zabar and I and our, our colleagues, Michael Lerman and a number of other people, in the early 80s, we were seeing a lot of patients here in the clinical center uh, with kidney cancer as part of the IL-2 program, Steve Rosenberg, in the surgery branch in those days. And um, we looked at tumors with, uh, uh, from patients with localized with kidney cancer, and we showed that there was a consistent loss of a chromosome, of chromosome 3, in those tumors from patients with clear cell kidney cancer. Now, we were so happy about this. We published this in Nature, and we then started mapping. We said, well, we're going to find this gene in this location. And we mapped and mapped and mapped and spent about three years doing this. And you know, you never forget things. I'll never forget that we spent six months trying to refine our strategy. We talked to everybody we could. We went over and saw Bert Vogelstein. We talked to all sorts of people. And we came to the conclusion that I think my, our lab working 13 hours a day, six days a week, and Bert's lab working 13 hours a day, six days a week, with the tools we had available to us in the middle 80s, we could definitely find a gene in this location within 54 and a half years. So we kind of assumed that uh, we thought we were nice people, but we assumed they wouldn't fund even us for that long. So we talked to a bunch of people, including the great Al Knudsen. And Dr. Knudsen said, if there is a hereditary version of your cancer, you could, you could study families and do genetic analysis. You could make your own probes. So that's what we did. We set up a hereditary cancer program. Again, someone like me, you could never, I could have, we could have never done this anywhere else other than here at the clinical center. I mean, it's just to have all these people to work with. I think uh, my assistant told me the other day that she said, Dr. Linhan, uh, you work with 147 different people from 29 labs and branches from nine different institutes at NIH. So this really is a trans-NIH project. I mean, there's a whole number of people who could be standing up here giving this talk besides me. But this was in the days uh, before there was a Francis Collins, or before Francis Collins was head of the Genome Project, let's put it that way. <laughs> there was no Genome Project. So we had to be our own Genome Project then. I mean, there was no other way. So we set up a program to uh, uh, bring in families and evaluate them and determine who was affected, who wasn't, so we could do genetic linkage analysis. And this took a army of colleagues to work with. I'm going to talk about five different types of inherited kidney cancer uh, that we've worked on, VHL, hereditary papillary renal carcinoma, Bert Hogg Bay, HLRCC, and SDH kidney cancer, and I'll show you how each one of them is caused by a different gene, of course, but also how very different they are. And again, over the years, we've had the unbelievable opportunity to evaluate nearly a thousand families with multiple members have kidney cancer. I list up here the people, we call this FRC, this is familial renal cancer. So when we started, we started with VHL. Well, so we had VHL and then we had FRC, familial renal cancer. We didn't know 
what the diseases were. They weren't named. We didn't have any genes for them. So every year we take more people out of the FRC category and put them in named gene syndromes. So we're going to start where we started, which was VHL, von Hippel-Lindau, hereditary cancer syndrome. Patients are at risk, autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. Patients are at risk to develop tumors in a number of locations, including, of course, uh, bilateral kidney cancer. These patients are at risk to develop bilateral multifocal kidney cancers and cysts in the kidneys. In science, we don't say always, often, but these are always clear cell kidney cancer. We have seen thousands of these tumors that Dr. Marino has looked at, and they are always clear cell. These patients also get cysts in their kidneys, and inside those cysts, this little yellow material is clear cell kidney cancer. Kidney cancer. Now, again, we have, I don't know, I think 700 knockout mice. We have about 500 cages of xenograft models. We have great cell line models in the lab. But this is our model, the human model. This is the model we've studied over these years, and this is the model that's enabled us to make any progress we've made. Now, when we look at these patients' tumors, we look at these patients' kidneys, we estimate they, get, they have all sorts of little tumors. We estimate they get up to 600 tumors per kidney. Therefore, when we do surgery, we're not curing these people. We're setting back the clock. That's our approach, to get them through their lives with their normal kidneys and, of course, normal pancreas and adrenal intact. It used to be said that clear, that VHL-associated kidney cancer wasn't an aggressive cancer, wasn't like real kidney cancer. In my field, that was published in the 80s, my field just didn't understand the term lead time bias. Uh, these are exactly the same as sporadic non-hereditary kidney cancers. We estimate from, so this is a patient who came to us with a large VHL tumor. It had spread to her chest, metastatic disease. We estimate from the time of this, this is on the basis of about 17,000 tumor measurements, from the time of the second hit in this cancer gene to two centimeters, we estimate that time is about 25 years. So this is like a little bit like prostate cancer, very slow growing cancer. But when it gets to a certain size, it can spread. So we've managed these patients now over I think 27 years, very careful, consecutive management here at, NCI, at NIH, and we've developed a clinical approach. Now, the first patient I saw with VHL, I was a young kid here, and um, the way we manage them, and the way we manage cancer in my field, and I talked to everyone here and all of my colleagues and read the literature, the way you handle kidney cancer, you remove the kidney. Well. I took out both of that patient's kidneys. And you know, you never forget some things. I'll never forget when I took that patient down in the old entrance to the hospital, I took him down, put him in a taxi cab, sent him home to be on dialysis. And I said, I don't care what they say, I'm never doing this again. And we started then doing partial nephrectomies. I got a lot of gas about it at the time for my field, but after a while, kind of became accepted. Well, we operated, and these, we would, people would get new tumors. We'd operate, get new tumors again. I remember one time talking to one of the fellows and doing one of these cases, and I, we were doing a patient for the third time on the same kidney. Within about five years, I said, you know, we're going to have to put zippers in these people. And uh, so we started an approach then of we did a bunch of calculations about metastasis, and we developed an approach to do active surveillance, and that is we would not operate. I know today that sounds kind of not so unusual, but when we did this, it was, we, could, we had a lot of criticism, let's put it that way, about this approach, not operating on cancer. So we started doing active surveillance until the largest tumor reached three centimeters. And at three centimeters, we recommend intervention. Now, in 27 years, as of November 20th, 2013, when using this strategy, we have not yet 
had one single patient develop metastatic disease. Now, surgically, for years, we would do open operations. We've now gone to a robotic approach. And Adam Metwally recently took out 54 tumors from a single patient's kidney with this robot. Uh, we've done as many as, I think, 74 with an open operation. I want to show you this because many of you are not cancer people. I want to show you what these cancers look like. But also, I want to show you this. This is part of the phenotype. In other words, I'm going to show you this is how we manage the ones with VHL mutation, with the next gene, which is going to be MET, the third gene, which is going to be folliculin FLCN, that Dr. Collins mentioned. But this is very different from the way we manage patients with Krebs cycle enzyme mutations, fumarate hydrotase, and succinate dehydrogenase. So I'll just show you this. So this is a robotic partial nephrectomy. You can see the tumor here, and with the robot just coming right around this. I think Peter Pinto was the one who was doing this case, was just coming right around this tumor. And as you can see, we're not getting much of a margin. We're just enucleating, all right? Now, we know this tumor. We know this gene. And we know how this behaves. And we have never had a problem with this, and we've not had one patient develop metastatic disease. Now, I'll show you this is very, very, very different from a couple other types of kidney cancer I'll show you in a minute. These patients also develop tumors in the adrenal glands. You can see here, this is an eight-year-old child. Also in the pancreas, they get pancreatic cysts, and they get pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, which are malignant tumors which can spread. These patients also get tumors in the brain and spine cerebellar hemangioblastoma. These are spinal hemangioblastomas. This patient has two. We have patients who have hundreds of these. And if you want to have a snapshot in your mind about what this gene pathway is, this is a good picture. So this is one that Ed Oldfield was doing. This is the spinal cord, and this is the spinal hemangioblastoma. And you can see it's vascularity. OK, it's extremely vascular. The VHL gene, as I'll show you in a minute, is an oxygen sensor. So when, it, when a cell thinks it's short of breath, it needs more vasculature, it needs more energy, it needs more blood, a bunch of things. I'll show you that pathway in just a minute. These patients, I might also add that uh, we couldn't have even thought about doing this work without our wonderful colleagues, uh, Ed Oldfield, uh, Russ Lonzer, uh, more recently, uh, Karim Zagpol and Prasant Chetabandia from the Neurological Surgery Branch, and we're incredibly appreciative of their support of this work over the years, as we are of Jeff Norton and now Electron Kebabu, our colleagues in general surgery. And in ophthalmology, uh, the great Emily Chu has been with us all these years, helping to manage these patients. And without them, we never would have, have never been able to do the phenotype assessment, never would have been able to manage these patients uh, over the years. These patients also develop retinal angiomas. These are benign tumors. They're extremely vascular. This is the first manifestation of VHL. You can see these in one-year-olds. That's why we recommend germline mutation testing at age one, because photodynamic therapy can oftentimes save visual fields. And it really makes us sick to see a patient who's lost their vision because they weren't detected early and didn't have early treatment. These patients also develop inner ear tumors. 12% of our patients. Uh, develop what's called an endolymphatic sac tumor, which is in the endolymphatic sac canal. It's a benign papillary tumor. But if it progresses unabated, these patients can lose their hearing. So our uh, neurosurgeons and Dan Chu, our, our ear, nose, and throat surgeons, are doing a study to see if early surgical intervention will preserve hearing in this patient population. So if we wanted to find this gene. We brought patients here to this wonderful clinical center perform genetic linkage analysis. And again, this is with uh, Bert Sabar, Mike Lerman, a number of colleagues. And we're able to, we evaluated DNA from 4,312 patients to do this. This actually took us about 10 years to do this project. Uh, localized uh, the gene to the short arm of chromosome 3. And then in the spring of 1993, we were able to localize and identify the seventh cDNA that we looked at, we called G7, which turned out to be the VHL gene, which was the sixth human cancer gene identified when we found this. 
We've now looked at uh, 371 families and detected VHL mutation in every single one of them. The mutations we see are really a, 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 a catalog for grad students in genetics. Two-thirds of our tumors are frame shifts, nonsense, missense. About a third are deletions. Uh, about two-thirds of those are partial deletion, and about a third are complete deletion. And about 5% of our mutations, or you might say mechanical, are uh, splicing defects. <clears throat> then we wanted to see, was this the gene we would looked for for so long? Not a given. This is going to be the case. The ladies that, uh, in the families, the lady who is not in a hereditary breast family who has uh, breast cancer, it's not obvious that BRCA1 or BRCA2 will be involved in her cancer. So we just didn't know. But it turned out, when we looked at tumors from patients with non-hereditary, sporadic, clear cell kidney cancer, we find a high percentage of mutations of this gene. We find mutation of the gene and loss of this gene. Most recent study was with uh, Mike Nickerson and Lee Moore out of, out of NCI, and that was about 412 tumors, and nearly 90% had either mutation or methylation of that gene. Recent study out of uh, Japan by Sato and all showed a 95% uh, rate of mutation methylation or mutation of one of the partners of the VHL gene. So I think it's clear to say that VHL is the clear cell kidney cancer gene. So we find that, we found that here in clear cell, but we don't find it in type 1 papillary, type 2 papillary, chromophobe, oncocytoma, collecting duct. In other words, the other types of kidney cancer. So the first inclination that there was a genetic differentiation among the different types of kidney cancer. So what kind of gene was this? Well, it turned out to be a cl classic Knudsen two-hit tumor suppressor gene. We have mutation of the gene and loss of the second copy of that gene. So we made a cell line uh, of the first line. It was described uh, as a uh, VHL, uh, excuse me, as a clear cell kidney cancer line with a VHL mutation, put it in a mouse, we made one single change in those cells, one change. We put a normal copy of that gene back in those cells, and we get no tumor or a very small tumor. So very, we thought, very strong data that this is a loss of function tumor suppressor gene. Then we wanted to know how does this gene work. It was a completely novel gene. We had no idea in the world what this did. So we started working with, with uh, Rick Klausner. This was in the middle 90s and Roxanne Duan, who was a postdoc in our lab, uh, working with Rick and his uh, colleagues, uh, Arnim Paws and Stephen Lee, uh, did a pretty straightforward, now in retrospect, experiment, which is ip VHL, and pulled down these two bands here. Well, we worked with Billy Burgess up at the Red Cross, and Billy slept in the, slept in the lab for five and a half days uh, to do this sequencing, and showed that this band here, which had just been put in GenBank, this sequence, uh, something called a Longan C. And we called that weekend uh, Ron and Joan Conaway at the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Uh, and uh, they were dumbfounded by why we were calling them. We told them this, that the, whatever this gene is binds VHL. Uh, and we had another gene, we didn't know, we had another protein we'd sequence, we didn't know what that was. We emailed that to them. And they said that's a long in B, which they hadn't put, they hadn't communicated anywhere yet. So we published this and published this in science, and we're very happy about that and kind of proud of the work, but it still didn't help us understand the function of this gene or this pathway. <coughs> Until this gel, which was run by Arnim Paws in Rick's lab, Rick Klausner's lab, and uh, Arnhem had IP'd VHL and run, ran a bigger gel uh, and ran across this band right here that he sequenced, which was uh, a protein called a col2, colon2, which for, at the time was a recently identified tumor suppressor gene family in helminths. Well, once you put col2 along and C along a B VHL together, all of a sudden, then you could, you could go back to the yeast model, and all of a sudden you could make sense of this, that VHL is part of an E3 ubiquitin ligase complex that targets 
certain target proteins, and the most well-studied are, of course, hypoxia-inducible factors, HIF-1 and HIF-2, for ubiquitin-mediated degradation. And this was work done uh, by the Kalin Lab, the Ratcliffe Lab, Maxwell's group. Uh, and uh, over the years, we've come to understand that this is, sim I'll say simply, this is simply an oxygen-sensing system. When there's normal oxygen in the cell, the complex can target HIF, degrade it for ubiquitin-mediated degradation. When it's hypoxic, not enough oxygen, uh, VHL can't, so the VHL complex can't see HIF to degrade it, and HIF accumulates and then transcribes things such as VEGF, erythropoietin, GLUT1, GLUT4, things we know of, we think of as cancer. However, in our clear cell kidney cancers, where there's a VHL mutation, it's like the cell thinks it's short of breath. So no matter what the oxygen level is, HIF is not degraded, it accumulates, and you get a vascular cell, you get a cell that's making uh, uh, platelet-derived growth factor, all sorts of things to stimulate its own growth, stimulate growth of the cells next to it. So this provided the foundation for the development of a therapeutic approach for patients with advanced clear cell kidney cancer, i.e. targeting the VHL pathway. So as of today, seven different targeted therapeutic drugs, approaches, have been approved by the FDA for the treatment of patients with advanced kidney cancer, primarily advanced clear cell kidney cancer. So as thrilled as we are about this, we're not home yet. We, you can see dramatic response. You can see increase in survival. But most patients eventually, most times, this therapy eventually fails these patients. And even though you can sequence these drugs, uh, many times they go on to die of this disease. Now, just recently, the, uh, the uh, Cancer Genome Atlas, which, of course, is a wonderful project. It's the, I'd say it's the dream of a lifetime, this project. It's co-supported co by the uh, NHGRI and NCI, and uh, we were involved in the one looking at clear cell kidney cancer, which came out recently. Uh, and what was exciting about this was a number of things, not just that we found high mutation of VHL and other genes on chromosome 3, which had previously been seen, but this very well characterized it. These genes here that are on chromosome 3, that are centromeric to where VHL is, and these are chromatin remodeling genes, PBRM1, SETD2, and BAP1. Pretty remarkable. And these two genes here, SETD2 and BAP1, when they're mutated, that correlates with an aggressive phenotype and decreased survival. So you would argue, everyone argues, that V is the early thing, VHL is the early thing, but over the years, somehow, these other genes help it spread or help it become more aggressive. And recently, we looked at a family, and this was work done with Laura Smith and Kathy Volk and a number, Lindsay Milton, a number of people in our group, along with James, uh, with, uh, uh, James Brugarolis at Texas Southwestern, and a family we've been following for 11 years. We could, Lindsay couldn't find VHL mutation. We couldn't find SDH mutations. This family carries a mutation of that gene I showed you, BAP1, on chromosome 3. So we know now that this gene also can cause clear cell kidney cancer. This, this family here. But the other thing that we found, and this was work that really Chris Ricketts really put together, and that is that we were, we thought this was going to be the case, but we were really kind of shocked when we saw this. And that is that high grade, high stage, very aggressive kidney cancer in patients with low survival, in other words, bad disease, these patients' tumors undergo a metabolic shift. And this shift looks very much like another a couple of other types of kidney cancer, I'll show you in a minute, where the uh, TCA cycle enzymes are suppressed, suggesting decrease in oxfo oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, the enzymes for glycolysis are way up. The enzymes for the oxidative pentose phosphate shunt are way up. So stress, suggesting defense against oxidative stress. AMPK is down. 
That's going to be a recurring theme. I'll come back to that. And you have evidence of reductive carboxylation of, of a glutamine-dependent approach for making fatty acids and increasing cellular synthesis. So we saw that by doing this very, very complex integrative analysis of 480 tumors that only a, a project like the TCGA can do. So what I've shown you is that VHL, clear cell, kidney cancer, oxygen sensor. Okay? Now, how about the other types? So that's about 75% of kidney cancer is clear cell. Now, how about the other types of kidney cancer? What I thought I'd do is just walk you through how we got a little bit where we are. And again, it was all patients seen right here in this building. So this was the first one. This was a little girl, a young woman, 21 year old. She came here from Ohio with her mom, her worried mom, with this tumor in her kidney. I took this out. She went on to die eight months later of metastatic disease. I went over to see Maria Marino, who I've worked with so closely all these years, and I said, Maria, what kind of kidney cancer is that? And she said, Marston, it's papillary kidney cancer. I said, all right. So then in 89, in May, I saw another young woman who came up with her mom from Charlottesville, and she had this tumor in her left kidney, and I took this out, and she went on to die 10 months after that of metastatic kidney cancer. And her mom died 14 months after that of metastatic kidney cancer. I said, Maria, what is this? And she said, Marston, it's papillary kidney cancer. I said, all right. So this is a patient that we saw, this family, that we saw in uh, March of 92. So this guy, this man came up, he was 71 year old, he had metastatic kidney cancer. He had tumors in both kidneys, disease in his chest, eventually went on to die of metastatic disease. His sister came up with him and she had tumors in both kidneys, grow to be very large tumors. And his son came up, who at the time was 42. And he had tumors in both his kidneys. So I'll start with this guy, with this disorder first. This was Papillary, I said, Maria, what is this? She said, it's papillary kidney cancer. So this obviously ran in families. This had not been described previously. We called it, we named this hereditary papillary renal carcinoma. You can see this family, all the members that had kidney cancer in it. Highly penetrant, autosomal dominant, hereditary cancer syndrome, very rare. This is actually ultra rare disease disorder. Uh, bilateral multifocal tumors in the kidney. You can see this. You can see we estimate these people get up to 2,000 tumors per kidney. It's always type 1 papillary kidney cancer. Again, we developed a similar approach. And that is, have we had people with metastatic disease? Yes, we have. But we developed an approach here to intervene when the largest tumor reaches 3 centimeters. In 21 years, since, since 1992, we've not had one patient develop metastasis when managed in this fashion. So we brought patient people to this marvelous clinical center, did genetic analysis, linkage analysis. This was primarily Laura Smith, Bert Zabar, Mike Nicholson, and localized this to the long arm of chromosome 7. Looked at a number of things, including these candidate genes, and the gene for this disorder turned out to be met. Met, which, as you know, and which, uh, it, which, uh, uh, Mike, uh, which uh, uh, Don Batero had shown uh, uh, that HGF is the ligand for this cell surface receptor uh, called MET. So this is what we find is mutations in the tyrosine kinase domain of this. So this is a dominant gene. VHL is tumor suppressor gene. This is an oncogene, proto-oncogene. You say oncogene here. So these are the actual mutations we see in the tyrosine kinase domain of this gene. So we've looked at, uh, we've analyzed DNA. We've seen 12 families here. We've analyzed DNA from 22 families. 
There's only 25 families known in the world. So this is an ultra rare disease, but an important disease in many ways because MET is now such an important disease in lung cancer, stomach cancer, and a number of things. So we described an early onset form of this disease. Uh, Laura Smith did, and uh, these mutations he, were here in the ATP binding domain, so that could explain why we see such an aggressive phenotype in those patients with that mutation. So we were happy about that and happy to find the gene and happy to be able to tell patients who was affected who wasn't happy to make the diagnosis. However, what we really wanted to do was to hopefully, with all these disorders, develop an approach for therapy. So we this should be straightforward, not to say it will be, but it, you'd think it would be in a way. So Ram Srinivasan in our group, who's head of our molecular therapeutics program, uh, conducted a trial using a drug called ferretinib, which is the dual kinase VEGF receptor and MET receptor inhibitor. So I'll just show you one patient. So this is that first family I saw. This was the 42-year-old son. When I saw him, when we saw him in the spring of 92, I had seen these other families with this horribly aggressive disease, had these people die. We didn't know the difference then between this type of hereditary papillary kidney cancer, no one did, and those others, which I'll show you in a minute. So I took out this patient's left kidney. I wouldn't do that again, I'd do a partial. But in the spring of 1992, I took out his left kidney, you see here, in June of that year, of 92, we took out 12 tumors from his remaining right kidney, solitary right kidney. So, did fine, going back and forth to school, back and, back and forth to PTA meetings, back to work, to Little League baseball games. Develops tumors, again, as we've come to understand happens. And in the fall of 2000, we took out 59 additional tumors from his remaining right kidney. That's about 71 tumors so far, so it's okay. He's, he's, uh, he's got a little renal insufficiency. His creatinine's about 1.4. His EGFR is about 53, 54. He's doing okay. However, in about 2006, he starts to develop new tumors in that kidney, and his largest tumor in that right kidney, remaining right kidney, now is 3.4 centimeters. We don't like that. I don't want, we don't want him to die of metastatic disease like his father did. So Romson of Assen put him on this drug. When he came back the first time, his tumor had gone from 3.4 to 2.5. And the urologic oncology fellows said to me, they said, Dr. Linehan, they said, uh, wait, 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 wait a minute. This guy's tumor now is 2.5. He said, he's no longer a surgical candidate. I said, right. I said, that's what we're working toward. We're working toward making these non-surgical diseases. So after 49 cycles of ferretinib, his tumors became almost non-detectable. This was his largest, down to 1.4. He had a number of other tumors which basically disappeared. Now, are we home yet? No. But this was the first trial targeting a papillary kidney cancer gene showing that, that this is proof of principle of an effect. And I'll just show you this slide. This is 39 tumors in nine different patients. As you can see, every single one of them has gotten smaller with therapy. So uh, Dr. Ram is getting ready, get ready to start a new trial with a pure MET inhibitor. And we have a number of other approaches that he and Lynn Neckers, a number of our group, have, have developed here. And so we will see. Well, I'm, I'm, caught, I'm hopeful. The third one is, this was that first patient I, talk, I mentioned to you, the one from Ohio, that was papillary kidney cancer. So we made a cell line from this. And with Colin Cooper, well, we showed that there was an, a translocation from the first chromosome to the X chromosome. And then with Colin Cooper in England showed that what was happening here was that a gene on chromosome one was going to a gene on chromosome the X chromosome called TFE3. And this was the first description of TFE3 kidney cancer. We now know that TFE3 is part of a family of transcription factors, TFE3 
TFEB and MITF, which can all cause kidney cancer. MITF is a germline alteration that causes kidney cancer and melanoma. And we now know that uh, TFE3 kidney cancer is 1.5% of kidney cancers, but in, the, in, the, in children and young adults, it's 20 to 45%. So this is the most common type of kidney cancer in children and young adults. And we're working very hard uh, in UOB developing a therapeutic approach targeting TFE3, and we, we're very encouraged about some of the preclinical uh, results we have, and we're hoping to start clinical trials this year targeting this type of kidney cancer. So this is these three genes here. So next, I'm going to show you our fourth type of kidney cancer and kind of how we got into this. So we were seeing, we'll see anybody with multiple members of a family who have kidney cancer. And we saw this family, who at the time was thought to have bilateral multifocal oncocytoma and these identical twins. And we found a tumor in the father. So we then sent letters out to physicians around the country asking for families with familial oncocytoma. And what happened was the following. We saw a patient, Gladys Glenn was working with us at the time, I don't know if she's here today, and she called me and said, Marston, we've got a patient up here in one of these familial oncocytoma families who has got some funny skin bumps. I said, well, let's biopsy him and see what Paul DeRay, who was the dermatopathologist at the time here at NCI, thinks. We did that. Paul called me and he said, Marston, these people uh, have something that runs in families. I said, well, I know it. It runs in my family. He said, no, it runs in families. I said, I, I've got a family here. He said, no, it's been described. I said, what do you mean? He said, it was described by three guys in 1977. It's called Bert Hogg Dubé. They described these cutaneous lesions called fibrofolliculomas that run in these families. So we then went on to, and so these patients can get, can get very obvious cutaneous uh, fibrofolliculomas. They can get very subtle ones. These are little hair follicle tumors. They're benign tumors. So we then recruited these families and we showed that kidney cancer runs in these families. They can be solitary. They can be bilateral multifocal. They can be large. They can metastasize. The pathology here is very different. You can get different types of pathology. With VHL, it's always clear cell. With HPRC, it's always type 1 PAP. Here, we see about a third get chromophobe kidney cancer, about 60% get what Maria Marino calls hybrid oncocytic kidney cancer. We see a few clear cells and a few oncocytomas. We can see those different histologies in the same family, in the same patient, sometimes in the same kidney. We estimate these patients get up to 3,000 tumors per kidney. So again, our surgery is not curing them, but uh, we're setting back the clock. But usually if we do good surgery, most of these patients only need one kidney operated on per, per lifetime. So we do three centimeters. We recommend surgical intervention. And again, since 96, what's that, 17 years now, not one patient's developed metastatic disease when managed in this fashion. So. We wanted to find the gene. Again, we brought them into this marvelous facility. Uh, again, this was with Laura Smith, uh, Bert, uh, Michael uh, Nickerson. We used the, the fiber folliculomas as our marker, localized this to the short arm of chromosome 17, and in the fall of 2002, identified the FL, it was now called the FLCN gene, and we've detected mutation of FLCN now in 97% of 229 families. It's pretty remarkable changes we see in this gene. With VHL, we see nonsense, missense, frame shift, complete deletion, partial. Here, most of the mutations, almost all of them, are mutations predicted to truncate the protein. Usually it's a, a frame shift or a stop. It's pretty unbelievable. Uh, why that is, we don't know exactly. What? Uh, we're happy to be able to make the diagnosis and to tell in these families who's affected, who not, who needs screening, who doesn't. Uh, we and others have shown that these people also get lung cysts, 
92% of our patients get pulmonary cysts. You can see they can be very prominent. This is one Dave Frump operated on for us, two of them. But what we wanted to do was understand what kind of gene this is. Is this a tumor suppressor gene? Is it an oncogene? So Kathy Volk did this study where she looked at a number of tumors from patients like this patient that we operated on, and she found 70% of them had a second hit. In other words, this is a two-hit model. So Yao Fan Yang made a cell line, the only one in the world, actually, a follicular-deficient kidney cancer cell line, Gro makes tumors in mice, put folliculin back in, and it's like, it's like VHL. You get no tumor or a very small tumor. So we wanted to know how this gene functions. So, and this is the work of, uh, again, Laura Smith, Masaya Baba, Yukiko Hisumi, Hishashi Hisumi, and a number of others. Uh, and Masaya Baba ran this gel where he IP'd folliculin and he pulled down this protein here, which turned out to be a protein we named folliculin interacting protein 1, FNIP1. Hishashi Hisumi later identified and described another protein which we call FNIP2. Well, that still didn't help us understand, uh, understand how this gene works until this. Masaya IP'd FNIP1. And what he found was this band right here, turned, and this changed, this one, <laughs> this one band changed our entire focus, our entire direction of our work in kidney cancer because this pulled down the gamma subunit of AMPK. Now, as you know, AMPK is the grand central station of energy sensing in the cell. So this really was what gave us the first inclination that kidney cancer is fundamentally a metabolic disease. So we now know that folliculin binds FNIP1, FNIP2, which bind AMPK. And this puts this then in the LKB1, P10, TSC1, TSC2, mTOR pathway. Now, there's a lot we don't know, but there's a lot we do know. And again, Hishishi Hashimi and Yukiko Hashimi have shown that uh, deficient folliculin, folliculin knocked out, you get TORC1 and TORC2 activated. And what uh, Yukiko's current work is showing is that uh, this complex is critical to activation of AMPK, certainly by things like FinForm and Metform and ACAR. So we think maybe through LKB1, not totally sure, but, but we will see. But this is a basically a fundamentally metabolic pathway. So we're working on the following uh, approach, and we're, Ron Cernavastin is gearing up to do, potentially do clinical trials targeting either TORC1 or TORC2 in this hereditary cancer syndrome, and we're working also on some other pathways. Now, back to this little 18-year-old young, young woman that came up from Charlottesville, well, after she died and her mom died, we tried and tried. You know, you regret things you do in life, and I regret I didn't drive to Charlottesville and go to the police office and try and find this family. We couldn't find them. We later found out what happened. The children went with the, with the stepfather who had a different last name. We couldn't find them. And between the time we saw her and when we saw her first cousin, her brother died. Her mother died, her uncle died, her grandmother had died, and her great aunt. And later on, her cousin came to us with very advanced disease and ended up dying of this disease. So this is a very lethal form of kidney cancer, which we initially described in 95, which was redescribed and renamed, I might say better described, in 1999, and goes now by the name of hereditary lyomyomatosis renal cell cancer. These patients are at risk to develop both cutaneous and uterine lyomyomas and an aggressive form of kidney cancer. Autosomal dominant hereditary cancer syndrome. These cutaneous lesions basically are tumors of the erector pili, which is in the, which is at the base of the hair follicle. This is like an energy sensor. Normally, when you get cold, this contracts. Your hair stands on end and traps heat. Here, it's like it never stops contracting, and they form these tumors. 
And we, for, we worked with, uh, uh, with uh, Maria Turner for a long time. Now we're happy, so happy to work with Ed Cowan on this. And this, this is the manifest patient we saw just recently. These can be extremely symptomatic. We lost a patient. Actually, it was a family member of one of ours who, who took his life. Uh, just couldn't deal with it. These can be very symptomatic, and we're hoping to develop a better approach to therapy. Apologize for that. These patients also get uterine leiomyomas. These are benign, but they can be very, they're very early onset. 89% of our women in these families are affected with uterine leiomyomas. In our initial report, 50% of the women had had hysterectomies in their 20s. It's a catastrophic phenotype for women. Uh, currently, our gynecologic surgeons, uh, Pam Stratton and her colleagues, do myomectomies. We're proud to say we have four babies now after our myomectomies here. We're very happy about that. They get these very aggressive kidney cancers. This is the second patient I saw, a 21-year-old, came up here from Miami. I took out that with Jeff Norton, the big operation, took that out. This, boy, this young man lived uh, 17 months, died of metastatic disease. This is a patient who came. You can see uh, the cutaneous. They don't tend to cross, they don't cross the midline for some reason. They don't tend to. You can see we biopsied him. He was 32 years old. His father died at age 35, metastatic disease. We were just screening him. And we found this. These people get, they get cysts in their kidney. They get solid tumors. And they can get tumors inside the cysts. He had that. He had this cyst with a very small tumor one half centimeter. Now when he showed up, we were just screening him, he already had a large two centimeter node. So these spread early, very different than the other ones I showed you. Maria Marino has described this, and this is pretty much of a, I don't know if I'd say unique, but a pathognomonic picture for this. When she can just look at the path and tell you what this is. Uh, this is a form of type 2 papillary kidney cancer characterized by orangophilic nucleoli with these very prominent perinuclear halo. We see, these, we see this disease in 10-year-olds. We see it in 77-year-olds. This is a lifelong risk for cancer. Uh, very tricky to manage clinically. This is a patient who was 24, came to us with this CT scan. Well, I don't know. I can't call that. Uh, is that just a cyst or is there something inside that cyst? So we said, come back in three months. Let's do an MRI. Did an MR. Well, we couldn't call that. So we said, come back in nine months. We did this CT. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can't call that. I don't really know. We did the MRI, though, and we said, ah, we call this a double bump. So we operated. When we operated, and this operation was done by Gennady Braslavsky, we went way wide on this kidney. This was lower pole. We went all the way up to the hilum and really almost did a hemi-nephrectum. You can see Hang on. Sorry, my system has, there we go. So, you can see we did basically a hemi-nephrectomy, took off the lower pole of this person's kidney. When Maria called, Dr. Marino called me, she said, Marston, you've got to come over and look at this. She said, that little 24-year-old you operated on, she said, look, you've got tumor here in the cyst, like you expected, but look at this. You have tumor infiltrating all through up your parenchyma. I said, Maria, don't tell me my margin's positive. She said, no, your margin's fine. My word, you guys took a four centimeter margin, but this is halfway there. I said, Maria, we couldn't see it on imaging. And I said, you couldn't tell it surgically. You couldn't see the margin. She said, yeah. So we manage these very different than those other types. This was one, this was one that Adam Metwally did recently. Is that anything? It's hard to know. So we err on the side of intervening if we're not sure. Is that, there's something in there? He did a partial nephrectomy. Yeah, maybe. He did a partial nephrectomy on that. And, and Maria said, yeah, you've got cyst. You've got little, little tumor growing in the cyst. So I say that's like a little alligator waiting to count. But then she said, you've also got tumor invasive in there. So this is, 
this has got to be handled with kit gloves. This is a very frightening disorder. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip over this patient and talk about this one. So we recommend imaging every year. This is a lady we ask, if you, if you do it every year, we find small lesions, we get them out, patients do fine. This lady, we asked, we saw her in 03, her imaging was fine. You can see here, there was nothing there. In 06, she had imaging on the outside. We like it every year, but it was just three years later. Everything was fine. Then in December of 2010, I got a call from the University of Maryland. They said, Marston, uh, we think we've got one of yours over here. I said, what do you got? They said, this lady hadn't had imaging in four years. At that, at these nodes, 10 of 59 nodes positive. Dr. Srinav Ram Srinivasan is now treating her for advanced disease. So we do not recommend active surveillance. We treat these very differently than the other types of kidney cancer. Uh, and when we do surgery, we go very wide. This gene is on chromosome one, the gene fumarate hydratase. We've evaluated uh, 186 families. We found FH mutation in 98% of these families. This is a two-hit loss of function tumor suppressor gene. This is an HLRCC kidney cancer cell line. You put FH back in, no tumor. It's pretty remarkable, just an enzyme. So we said, how on earth could loss of a Krebs cycle enzyme cause cancer? It doesn't make sense. Why doesn't that kill the cell or something? Well, just the opposite. We showed with Nav Shandell and Ralph De Berardinus that, that these cells, it's no longer a cycle, it's linear, but these cells shift to a glutamine-dependent reductive carboxylation pathway, which, by the way, gives us a number of novel targets along the way which we could target. Then we showed in the lab, and primarily Yao Fang Yang did this work, that the FH-deficient clear cell kidney cancer uh, doesn't take up oxygen. These cells, oxidative phosphorylation, the, the TCA cycle, the electron transport chain, are severely impaired. And these cells ramp up glycolysis. So they sh this is a shift to aerobic glycolysis. It's like a Warburg model. This is the Warburg model. Yaofeng showed also that if you take a VHL, kidney cancer cell line, clear cell, with a V mutation, and you grow it in culture, and you put it in low glucose, it basically laughs at you. But on the other hand, if you take these cells, this most aggressive type of kidney cancer, they're exquisitely sensitive. She puts them in low glucose, and they all die. So they're very sensitive to this. Well, clinically, what we found is this translates step by step to our patients. So these people, we do an FDG PET scan, they light up like a Christmas tree. It's sad, you can pick up every one of these tumors. This is a patient who came to us with metastatic disease. Ram Srinivasan is looking at the PET scanning on these patients. You can see this patient, initially this was thought to be normal, this CT scan. Is this vascular, is it something? We did a PET scan. Oh man, 54 year old radiologist. Uh, this patient here, does, is, there, is there something in there? We're not totally sure. Yes, there is. Well, if you look at this chest, I don't know. These vessels, which one of these? What's going on? Yeah, it's all right there. Even the skin lights up. Remember this guy? Look at this. Pet scan. The uterus in these leiomyomas light up. They lose the second allele. They've shifted to aerobic glycolysis. So Tracy Ruout and Wing Hang Tan showed the following, that in these cells, this is sort of counterintuitive, but what happens is they make, because of glycolysis, even though oxfos is shut down, even though this is inefficient, glycolysis goes up so much, they make a lot of ATP, and AMPK is suppressed. It's inhibited. Well, that tells the cell to grow. It says, I got a lot of energy, let's go. So it has a lot of effect, downstream effects on the iron transporters, stabilizing HIF and all. However, just keep this in mind, decrease AMPK. Now, Carol Sobier treated these cells with metformin. We're now looking at finformin and a number of other things, and saw a very dramatic effect. She could have a huge effect on the invasion of these cells. And when she's combined it in preclinical models in vitro and in vivo, with a other uh, targeted agents targeting other parts of this pathway, you can cure all these animals. So this, we think, 
targeting the metabolic basis of this has some significant potential. Now, with Lynn Neckers and Jen Isaacs, we showed that when fumarate hydratase is knocked out, fumarate goes up. And fumarate is fundamentally an oncoprotein. And this was really the first study to show this. That fumarate outcompetes alpha ketoglutarate for binding to prolohydroxylase and essentially poisons it. So what you end up with then is a VHL independent mechanism for dysregulation of HIF degradation in fumarate hydrotase deficient kidney cancer. So these cells then develop, uh, uh, they then get a lot of VEGF, goes up, GLUT1, GLUT4. We say, yeah, these guys really need that. They need the vasculature. And we kind of reason that these cells might actually really be sensitive to targeting the vasculature because they're so dependent on glucose and actually glutamine, but glucose in the short run for their survival, even though they're so aggressive. So Ron Cernavassin ran a trial, pilot trial. He's now doing a bigger formal trial with targeting with bevacizumab and erlotinib. Bev to target uh, VEGF in the vasculature and erlotinib potentially to target maybe glucose transport and glycolysis. Now, how can I put this? At two different site reviews, I was told this doesn't work. You know, what are you guys thinking of? And I said, wait a minute, you're talking about clear cell kidney cancer. That's a different gene, it's a different disease. Here it might. And we've seen dramatic response. This was one of the first patients. Up until this point, this disease, we, lo I lost, we lost every one of them, who developed, just about who developed metastatic disease. It was really not treatable. This is a woman who came to us, 42-year-old, who'd had surgery on the outside, and the doctor didn't realize it was HLRCC. He didn't realize you had to go wide. He did a regular partial nephrectomy and left a lot of disease on the kidney and disease basically all throughout her abdomen. We, we have biopsy proof and everything else. And you can see it on the PET scan. Now, both of this year, she is, both her sisters died of metastatic kidney cancer, as did her father. Ron put her on this, or Dr. Sinovastin put her on this approach with Bev, Bevacizumab and Erlotinib. After three months, she had a complete response. She later developed a new small tumor in about three and a half years in that left kidney, which we took out, independent, separate tumor. It's going to happen. She's now seven years out, and we cannot find evidence of disease. So I think what I'm going to do is conclude by saying that what I've shown you is that kidney cancer is fundamentally a metabolic disease. It's made up of a number of different types of cancer, different histologies, different clinical course, caused by different genes, and that each of the kidney cancer genes that are currently known, each one of them, affects the cell's ability to sense oxygen, iron, or nutrients, or most obviously in the TCA cycle, Krebs cycle enzyme kidney cancers, fumarate hydratase and succinate dehydrogenase energy. And it's our hope that targeting the metabolic basis of kidney cancer will provide the foundation for the development of an effective form of therapy for patients with this disease. I want to acknowledge my wonderful colleagues that I've had the honor to work with, and uh, my, my colleague, Bert Zabar, uh, my colleagues uh, in our group in UOB, also Lynn Neckers, Don Botero, Kathy Volk, Tracy Ruralt and her group, our colleagues in neurosurgery, ENT, general surgery, ophthalmology, derm, endocrinology, uh, who we couldn't have done this work without. I also want to mention in particular Dr. Ram Srinivasan, Peter Pinto, Adam Metwali, Piyush Agarwal, Maria Marino, who's been by our side for 27 years uh, managing these patients, Peter Choiki and Brad Woods, the two best radiologists I've ever met, the most sensational group of urologic oncology fellows, and finally, the most gifted, accomplished, talented, and committed group of, uh, of individuals to work with us to manage our patients, our nursing and patient, patient management staff, our physician's assistants and RNs, 
and an incredible group of patient care coordinators and data managers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marston, for typifying what we had hoped this lecture would be and doing it so elegantly. Uh, but the hour is getting a little late, so what we're going to recommend is we, we're going to have a reception for Marston in the library here in, in their lounge, and you're all welcome to come and uh, discuss uh, informally with Marston and each other uh, the incredible uh, opportunities for kidney cancer that he described. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.